I want to welcome everyone today to our May pecan topics. We have um, have several things that we're going to talk about today, and hopefully I can get my screen to share properly. Uh, having a little difficulty there. Is it showing up all right, Charlie? Yeah, I can see it. <clears throat> That's good. All right, so uh, we're going to talk about uh, some of the things that are going on around the state, and it's going to be different depending on your location, uh, but it's I've heard a lot of people from a lot of uh, different areas around Oklahoma having the same uh, freeze injury. So we'll cover that in just a minute. But some of the things from our calendar for pecan grower fact sheet, that's HLA 6200. You can Google that uh, fact sheet and bring it up and it gives you the, uh, the calendar for the season. And so you can take a look at what are some of the things to be considering um, things that you may need to be uh, doing for management that, that month. But um, right now, if your newly planted pecan trees that you planted in February or March are starting to push some buds and have growth, might be a time to go ahead and fertilize those. We don't really start fertilizing until they actually start to begin growth. So it may be a good time um, to do that right now, depending on how your trees are, are looking. And our fact sheet, LA, HLA 6232 has a schedule for those newly planted trees and, and how to fertilize those. And we talked a little bit about that in one of our uh, last uh, couple of Zooms, we talked about fertilizer applications. Um, it's also time for most people to be doing bark and four flap grafting. And so um, we've kind of, the trees that did have some freeze damage, once they start growing again, uh, and we can monitor to see how, how much damage they have sustained. Some of those, if they start pushing and growing well, they may be able to be grafted uh, right now as well. So kind of uh, site by site, maybe a little bit different, but normally we think of our grafting time is uh, in the Southern part of the state, that mid to late April. In the Northern part, we, we think of grafting in May and uh, into to June a little bit. We'll be talking about pecan nut case bear with, with Phil in just a little bit. And then uh, growers can uh, be doing some uh, mowing if they're not gonna be having grazing in their orchards, keep those, uh, those weeds down or, or mowed, just competition with our trees. And then um, Charlie's gonna be talking about training young trees. And so that'll be on the, the program for today. That's another task that needs to be continued through the season but we'll cover, cover uh, how to do that. And then zinc needs to be continued to be applied uh, if you're putting on insecticides or fungicides uh, for at least the first three sprays or so for your mature trees, go ahead and apply zinc as well. And then um, for the young trees, about every couple of weeks, it's, it's really beneficial to apply that zinc as a foliar application. And also uh, be monitoring for your disease control, your pressure, if we need to be applying fungicides. And then irrigation depends on, you know, if we're going into a dry spell or if it stays pretty wet, uh, we may need to be thinking about applying some, some irrigation uh, if it dries up a little bit. Just wanted to give you a little information about the, the pecan class, what we did this last uh, month. We uh, had several topics, including soil and, and water quality. We talked about pecan nut case bear, uh, diseases other than scab. Uh, Charlie talked about that for the group. And then we had uh, Dr. John Long talk about sprayer calibration. And we got to go outside and, and actually calibrate a herbicide sprayer and an and a air blast sprayer. So it's always better to, to see how to do it than just you know, hear about it. And then we also uh, had Jim Smith uh, he's a pecan grower in Shawnee, and he came and, and demonstrated how to do a bark graft using the American method. And, uh, and then we uh, all got to practice a little bit. And uh, so you might remember this picture from, from last month, if you joined in. We had uh, pictures from around the state, and this was kind of the, the the northwestern part with the northeastern part of the state and how the southern parts were, you know, not too far ahead, but maybe a little bit last month. 
but uh, everything was coming out. We were starting to see some of those catkins develop and the leaves were expanding on some of those, those varieties. And then uh, 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 we had another late April freeze. And so April 21st, this is what Mesonet recorded for the minimum air temperatures. But Mesonet sites aren't always in your Becky, you're muted. Okay. We may be, are, am I okay now? Yeah. Okay. We, even though Mesonet showed, you know, 29 degrees in Perkins at the Mesonet station, that's up on top of the hill at the research station. So at the bottom of the section to the south, it may have been closer to 26 or 27 in some locations. So it really makes a big difference on where you are, your elevation, if you're in a frost pocket area where that cold air is going to settle on the temperature that your orchard, your grove may have experienced. And so there's a lot of variation in damage um, across the state, but we're seeing damage in, in most every, every county. Even down in the, the southeastern counties where they're usually a lot warmer, they had uh, some damage down there as well. Now, what do things look like, um, let's see, across the state April 20th after that freeze? Uh, these are some pictures that I had sent in to me. Now, it doesn't mean everything they had looked like this, but this was some of the damage that they were seeing, at least on the lower uh, portion of the tree. And in some instances, mm -hmm. the entire tree was frozen back especially on, on young, uh, younger trees that are much smaller, they had significant uh, burn back as well. So this is what it looked like maybe the next day after the freeze. And then let's see if I get my mouse to work with me here. Then, so if we look at some of the trees that were in different areas of the, the orchards, this one is from around Sky Took. And this is a big, um, had some big trees in the orchard. Here's some of his planted trees, but had some old native trees up in one area. And you can see how right about the middle of that uh, growth, the top is still green. The bottom part has um, been frozen back, lost, most of the leaves, and but the top part is, is protected. So it was a little bit warmer up there, but unfortunately most of his trees were lower than that level as well. So we had what's called a radiational freeze. We had clear skies. It was really uh, dry uh, conditions, calm air, uh, not a lot of wind or breezes. And so all the warmth from the, the soil is, is lost because we didn't have any cloud cover. And so all that cold air is, is lost in, into the atmosphere. And so uh, all, or actually the cool air is settling at the ground and the warm air is lost um, up into the sky. And so we have these inversion layers where it may be a couple of degrees warmer, just even at the top of the tree versus at the soil line. And so in this case over here, uh, this tree is showing some similar uh, similar leaf pattern as well. You have uh, the top of the tree is still green. They don't have any green down at the, at the lower part of that tree. So if all of our trees are really tall, we wouldn't have had a uh, freezing condition in, in that area anyway. But some of the methods that some of the growers tried uh, in their orchards to keep those temperatures up, we had some growers that were using um, super sacks with, with old pecans. It was, has a lot of oil burned uh, really hot and long. And so they think that did raise the temperature in, in their orchards, um, maybe a couple of degrees in areas. And, and the, the trees around that area, here is, it is at night, um, they didn't see a lot of damage in those, those areas. So might be something to consider. They also were trying to, to burn some hay bales, but they, they don't burn very hot. You have to continually move them to get them to, to keep burning. 
Another grower, he kept his sprinklers going on the ground, hoping that that, that water was a little bit warmer and might warm up the atmosphere. But in those, there, those areas that he used the uh, irrigation down on the ground, it really didn't affect the temperature enough to protect those trees. So he did have um, a lot of damage up in, in the treetops. Now he had a, an instance, I, I should have posted that picture as well, but one of the sprinklers, sprinklers was shooting directly up into the tree and where that continued to spray that uh, limb for that, uh, that evening while it was below those freezing temperatures, um, those, those uh, shoots were protected. Uh, the, the, the freezing of the water sends off a little bit of heat. And so uh, that one limb was protected, but the rest of the orchard was it? And then we had another grower that uh, hired some helicopters to come out and hover around in the in the orchard to try to maybe mix some of those warmer air inversion layers up higher down with that cool air down at the ground. And he really, that, um, he may have started a little bit too late on on getting this done with the helicopters, but he had some injury, but it looks a little bit better than last year when he didn't uh, didn't have this, but had the same type of freezing conditions in his orchard. So we'll be um, kind of taking a look at some of these and and maybe give you an update on how some of these orchards uh, look in the next month or two. And then we've got um, how do things look across the state right right now? Well, we've got some trees, they're putting out new shoots along the trunks. Uh, we've got a lot of new shoots there. The, the buds are finally starting to green up and push on some of the, the trees. This is in uh, the Sparks Chandler area in Lincoln County. And then these are some trees out at Cheyenne, out in the, the very northwestern part of the state. And uh, they, they didn't have too much damage and they are uh, coming out and um, growing pretty well. Uh, this is another picture from, I believe this is from the, that Chandler area as well. You can see where, I think this was Stewart, where they lost a lot of that green uh, foliage that was coming out, but we've got a, a secondary bud that's beginning to push. And so we'll uh, wait and see if there's any flowers produced on any of these new buds. But uh, even though we have um, the potential for a crop, uh, our, if we don't have enough catkins, we may not have good pollination. So that may limit our, um, our crop potential this season as well. We may have freeze damage on one variety and not another that's our pollinator. And so the, the timing may be thrown off and we may not get a uh, good fruit set just due to the lack of pollen. So, um, so what are some things we need to do if we do have that type of damage? Well, we really need to continue our management program because a lot of what we're doing for this year is going to affect next year's crop. So continue with our, our zinc applications once those buds are out and, and growing again, once you have um, enough tissue to spray that, that zinc coverage. And then uh, depending on your, your location and your variety selection, you may need to be applying fungicides, but uh, it, you might wanna check and see your potential for a crop before you put too many inputs into that, that crop as well. Um, you still need to fertilize because what we're putting on this year is going to affect next year's crop as well. But watch for flower development, and that's going to be on the end of those new shoots that are developed. So our catkins are going to be uh, closer to the base of the, that new shoot, and then we'll have that new growth, and our flowers will be out on the, the end of that new growth. So once those uh, shoots get long enough, start looking for, for those new flower clusters. And I have people uh, sent me pictures that they are seeing flowers on some of those, those uh, varieties that weren't hurt from the freeze. So a few things that were going on at the research station. We had a, a few uh, yellow aphids on some of our, um, I think these were Kansa, but they were feeding on the, the catkins and the leaf tissue. And they were going to uh, look and see if there was enough before they, uh, when they zinced again, and they may be adding an insecticide to cover those, those aphids. Uh, 
this, I think yesterday they were on brush pile burning duty. So it was a good time to get out there and, and burn those brush piles from all of our ice damage. And um, then they've continued to apply those zinc applications. I think we've had at least two this season, um, but they're also applying herbicides uh, as well. So trying to keep the weed, weed uh, pressure down. Wanted to mention that the OPGA Annual Convention and Trade Show is June 10th through the 12th. It is in person at the Stony Creek Conference Center in Broken Arrow. Um, we're having a mini pecan class. Uh, Charlie, Phil, Charles Rowland, and myself, we will be presenting uh, different sections from uh, one to five on that, uh, on that Thursday afternoon. And then the educational program with uh, a lot of special speakers will be on Friday from eight to five, a field day near Edna, or it's kind of close to uh, between Beggs and Bristow, uh, will be on Saturday from nine to one. And then there's a lot of uh, great vendors and equipment demonstrations and things that you can uh, be tuned in with as well. But go to that webpage, Oklahoma Grower, oklahomapongrowers.com, or contact me and I can get you information on, on the show. And then we have a monthly Zoom scheduled. Our next one will be June 4th. And then we have one for July 9th and August 6th. So you can keep, uh, keep updated with what we're, we're doing around the state. All right. Um, now we had some questions about uh, what to do if we, if we did have freeze damage. So does anyone want to um, want to talk about, uh, have any questions about what they need to do if they do have freeze injury on some of those trees? Any other questions on that? I know Dave asked about irrigation for, for trees that may have some, some damage. Um, you'll you'll want to just really check and see what your potential crop is because um, that may affect how much water you're applying at certain times, but you want to keep those trees healthy and, and not stressed. So keep an eye on your soil moisture to know if, if you need to be irrigating. Uh, it, we don't want to get those trees stressed and, and if they do have a crop, we don't want them to start to drop any due to, to drought or something. And then Phil um, put in the chat, if I sprayed with Roundup around my young trees recently, how long should I wait to fertilize? Phil, are your trees growing right now? They are, they've got growth pushed out. Um, you can go ahead and, and apply that fertilizer. And on those young trees, um, I like to put it about a foot away from the, the trunk in a band about 18 inches long. And so I'll just measure out the amount per uh, tree needed, and then I'll put it in a little strip about a foot away from the trunk of that tree. Okay, any okay. other questions on that, Phil? Both sides or just one side? Just one side is, is fine. Okay. It'll take it up and share with the rest of the tree. All right. Well, Phil, since you're up, you want to go ahead and, and talk about pecan nut case bear? Sure thing. Sure thing. Okay. Am I able to share my slides? Yes. Okay. Can you see him? Go ahead and do your, yep. How about, how about now? We need to do your display settings and switch screens. Okay. How's that? That's perfect. Okay. Thank you. So, we're, so we're going to be talking about pecan nut case bearer. That's our big pest right now. And this won't take too long. I, I'm not sure if we've covered any of this with the Zoom sessions previously. Um, but as my as my father would say, son, I love I love you enough to tell you again, you know, every time I'd misbehave. So he loves me. I love you all enough to tell you again about pecan nut case bear, if you've seen this already. This is the critter that we're monitoring for, and this is the stage that we're sort of monitoring for right now, or will be monitoring for real soon, uh, utilizing uh, sticky traps. And uh, what we suggest, uh, we'll show you the type of trap we're suggesting, which is a Farrakhan 6 trap. 
This is the pecan nut case bear. It's only about three eighths of an inch long, so it's not this big. It's very tiny. It has this raised set of dark scales on the about one third of the way back from the head. And those dark scales are very obvious. Uh, but you'll also find that the pheromone that we utilized for trapping for this um, male moth is so specific that uh, you don't really catch much of anything else in those traps except what might stumble in. And there's that raised set of scales. <clears throat> this is the larval stage. You don't really need to know what the larva looks like because you're going to be looking for the damage, the eggs and the damage. But suffice it to say that they can affect an entire cluster. This is the egg stage of the uh, pecan nut case bearer. After the pecan uh, has been pollinated, the stigma portion, this portion of the nut, turns dark. It goes from a greenish color to a dark, almost blackish color. And that's when the pecan nut case bearer starts to lay those eggs out there. Now, with a light year that we probably are facing this particular year, this may not be a significant pest. And another thing that affects the, the level of oviposition or egg laying and even adult activity are hard weather events. So if we have a lot of thunderstorms, a lot of hail, a lot of wind and rain at the same time, uh, we can see a dramatic decrease in pecan nut case bear. I think this is why we don't uh, suffer from too much of this problem uh, as opposed to maybe Texas and uh, maybe even Georgia, uh, they don't have the, the extreme weather events that we do during this time of the year when pecan nut case bear uh, becomes more common. The eggs take about five days before they hatch and they'll change from a white color to this almost pinkish red color. And when you see them going to the pink or red stage, that means they're just about to uh, hatch into a larva. This is, the, uh, this is the trap that we suggest, which is a Farrakhan 6 trap. It's from Trace A Incorporated. Trace A is out of Adair, Oklahoma. So you can obtain that trap and I'll give you the address here and the contact information in a moment. But these are the pecan nut case bears. And you can see this trap bottom that goes at the bottom of this trap uh, is very specific. The pheromone is very specific to these male moths. Now we're trapping only the males because it's a female pheromone. And you can see there's the raised set of dark scales on the males and, and the females are similar too. raised set of dark scales about one third of the way back. This one's turned upside down, but you know that the pheromone is so specific that that's a case bearer as well. And these are just coincidental little leaf hoppers, and there's a fly in there. There's another leaf hopper. Nothing that you have to worry about. Occasionally, you may get a large moth in there. The other moth that you may see from time to time is called a pecan bud moth. And unlike the raised set of dark scales, it has sort of a diamond, a double diamond shaped uh, marking on the on the wings. So very distinctly different than what you see with pecan nut case bear. And what we suggest is, is scouting should begin in about seven to 10 days after that first trap catch. We can even go a little bit further and say 13 days is okay. Uh, and we wanna examine 10 clusters per tree across several trees. And if you find two or more clusters that have eggs or larvae, uh, before you reach 310 clusters checked, if you are able to find 310 clusters, then, uh, then that's the time to make an insecticide application. If you have less than two clusters that are found infested, you want to repeat the sampling in about three days. And you need to be very diligent about this because uh, we have seen, even in this part of the, of the state, even in Stillwater, Oklahoma, or outside Stillwater, Oklahoma, we have seen 80, 90% damage from pecan nut case bearer. It's rare, it's very unusual, but we do see that from time to time. And we're gonna talk about some other things that can be managed with what we're gonna recommend for pecan nut case bearer. The second generation comes on in about six weeks later, about 42 days later. 
So if we look at the economics uh, associated with pecan nut case bearer, about 1% infested clusters for first generation and 2% for second and third generation. If we have an on year where we've got good production, and let's say that's, that uh, is equivalent to about 2,500 pounds per acre, uh, 65 nuts per pound. And let's say that our market value is $1.80. I hope it's better than that. Uh, we'd have about 40,000 clusters per acre. If we had a 1% infestation, that would be about 400 clusters per acre that we'd be losing. And that's equivalent to about $32 lost per acre if we let that first generation uh, and the second, gen second and third generation just have the crop or have that portion of the crop. On an off year, you've got, you're already starting with 1,000 pounds less potentially lighter nuts and same sort of market value, but you've only got about 26,000 cl clusters per acre. A 1% infestation for first generation is about 260 clusters per acre. Three damaged nuts per, nuts per cluster is about 780 nuts, and that equals about $23 uh, in loss per acre. So, in that type of year, you could be taking a pretty good hit. So it sometimes people say, well, I'm on an on year. I've got a heavy production. I've got a large seeded variety. I'm going to let the pecan nut case bear take 5%. The only problem is they don't understand 5%. You do, but they don't. And uh, ultimately, they, if you let them have it during the first generation, you're going to see subsequent damage from second and maybe even third generation, and it could be equivalent to much, much more than uh, 5%. So we want to kind of keep ourselves in control of the crop production, not the case bearer. Okay, the larvae move after they lay their eggs, the larvae and the eggs hatch, they will move around for about two days before tunneling into the nutlets. And what we're looking for is uh, the frass, and the webbing around the base of those nutlets. We'll see that picture here in just a moment. First generation can destroy a whole nut cluster uh, because the nuts get larger uh, throughout the season that subsequent generations may just take one or two nuts, but there's no guarantee there either. The total days from capture of the first male moth to the, to the damage is generally 12 to 16 days after first uh, adult capture. Okay, so three to four generations per year, 42 days apart. And here's the damage that we're looking for, particularly for first generation. It's very characteristic. It's very tough also to see those eggs. So this is why I say get out there regularly and check for larval damage. Because if you at least capture the first two hits of larval damage, you can make that insecticide choice decision. But if, you, uh, if you're going out there once a week, you may miss it. You may miss it entirely. And uh, you could see that they'll affect the, they can affect the entire cluster. This nut will be taken out. That larva will exit the nut, probably at the base of the nut, and then go enter into another nut. So kind of keep that in mind as you make those decisions. This is the, uh, the lure here. It's a little rubber septum that contains the pheromone. It's very specific to pecan nut case bearer. You see the egg again in the adult stages and the trap and the uh, subsequent damage here in this particular case. Now, what we want to detect with these traps, uh, we used to use a, a pretty sort of somewhat sophisticated sort of degree day modeling system. And the problem was it varied a great deal across the state and it varied based upon the temperature fluctuations, obviously, that we'd get across the state at various sites. Uh, and so we came up with a better methodology, I think, and that is to utilize the, the pheromone that, that's very specific to pecan nut case bear and get those traps out there early. So the time to get those traps out is now, right now. Uh, we've detected pecan nut case bear in the past, as early as so May 9th, May 11th, uh, that's highly unusual, but we have detected it that early in the season. And this is the uh, information for ordering the pheromone. The trap is worthless without the pheromone, so make sure you get the trap and the pheromone. Make sure that you order from uh, 
from whoever you order that they send you both the trap and the pheromone. Uh, Tracy, I believe, has a, a three trap packet they will send. So it comes with three traps. Three traps is almost enough for every orchard situation. There's no standard for how many you need per orchard because keep in mind, we're trying to capture, we're trying to detect first capture, not total capture. We're not trying to come up with numbers necessarily that indicate that it's time to treat. We're just trying to see when that first sustained flight is occurring because as that number three point makes uh, suggests, we're looking for what's called a biofix. That's the, that's the time when you capture the two consecutive nights of moths in your traps. And that first date of the two consecutive nights is your biofix. So uh, a good way of looking at this uh, is orchard number one, number two, and number three here. You notice that we captured a first uh, male on orchard one, two, and three all on the same night. But our biofix is different. It's 16, 19, and 18. Yeah, that's this number up here should be 18. Uh, 16, 19, and 18, because we didn't capture, we caught something right away the second night, so two consecutive nights, but in the in orchard number one. In orchard number two, we skipped two nights and then finally caught something on the fourth night. And then after that, we caught a nut. We talk, caught two consecutive nights of captures. So there, therefore, our first night that we got of the two consecutive nights was the 19th. In the case of orchard number three, same situation, but they didn't skip two nights. They just skipped one, and we captured. And uh, and so, therefore, your your timing is May 18th. So two consecutive nights of captures, whether it's one or whether it's two, or whether it's five, whatever the case may be, that's our biofix. So based on that biofix, about 10 days later, we'll see 10% of the eggs deposited. What we suggest is we want you out there when about 25% of the eggs are deposited to begin scouting and follow that regimen that we told you earlier. I'll, I'm repeating it here on point number eight. You go out there and you look for 10 infested clusters, or two, or two infested, excuse me, two infested clusters before you check 310 clusters. But you may have to check all 310. If you reach two, that's that 1% damage that we're trying to stay below. <clears throat> so that's when treatment would be, uh, would be the time to, to make that time, or that would, that's when treatment would be necessary to avoid any further damage. Uh, treatment is not always warranted, and we've talked about that. So scout carefully and scout often. We say we recommend probably every two to three days during the, that very critical period between the 12 and 16 days after that biofix. So here we're at 13 days. So you probably should check within on day 15 and day 17. And then you probably are pretty assured that you've made the right decision. Oops. Okay. So in terms of control, we generally recommend uh, IGRs, insect growth regulators. IGRs are specific to the Lepidoptera, the, the immature stages of butterflies and moths. And the ones that we recommend are intrepid or confirm. I do say don't use Intrepid Edge. You certainly can use it. Uh, Intrepid Edge is a dual uh, mode of action. So it has two different modes of action, two different chemistries in it. The problem with uh, Case Bearer is that it has three to four generations per year. And so if you're using something like Intrepid Edge, you could potentially be exposing that population to two different modes of action. And if the insect ever develops resistance, it could resi develop resistance to both modes of action. So this is why I, I generally suggest something like Intrepid or uh, Confirm. There's a number of other products, uh, insect growth regulator products that are available like uh, uh, Turnstile and uh, uh, Troubadour that are also the same active ingredient as Intrepid. So and they will do a good job. So that product, Intrepid, has no longer has uh, 
patented, you know, it's patented, but it or it's copyrighted, but it's no longer patented, so that uh, other generic forms are available out there. If you are interested in more of a safer approach or an organic approach, you can use Intrust, uh, Javelin, or Dipel. Uh, those products can also uh, do a fairly good job. Keep in mind that any of those products, the IGRs or the um, organic products, are effective, very effective, and they don't kill beneficials. So, or they don't, they're very gentle on beneficials for the most part. Uh, so they will do a fairly good job and give you adequate control and they're relatively safe for the applicator as well. There's other choices out there, but most of the other choices are petroleum-based insecticides that are a little bit more toxic. So we gotta be careful about the choices that we make. And since we have some good chemistries out there, we might as well take advantage of them. Intrepid and Confirm too, I should say, if you use that with a good spreader sticker, they hang on for such a long time that you get the next pest that I'll mention, which is the fall webworm. Has an, uh, the Intrepid and the Confirm uh, materials have such a tremendous residual activity when used with a good spreader sticker, uh, that fall webworm, which comes on generally about the end of June, uh, is controlled with that application of uh, Intrepid or Confirm. And it looks like we, you know, sometimes it looks like we have just continual populations of larval webworms. And what we have are two different races. We have an orange-headed race and a black-headed race of uh, fall webworms, and they do not overlap. So subsequently, we, we have a high infestation of webworms from year to year, depending upon how much most of our commercial growers uh, really don't have too much of a problem with this uh, because they are using the IGRs. Oops, oh, okay. And that's what we see with fall webworm. They feed on the, uh, they feed on the terminal portions of the branches. In this case, this is a small tree. So they'll encompass in the, with the webbing, they'll encompass the entire tree. And they feed exclusively in the webbing. So if they're not in the webbing, they're not webworm. And if they don't have webbing, if they, oh, did I shift modes of action? Oh, there we go. Okay. And if they don't have webworm, they, uh, they may be something entirely different like walnut detainer or walnut caterpillar. And so if we see the uh, feeding on the, the leaves extensively where they leave behind them, the petiole or the main rachis and the petioles, then uh, this is walnut caterpillar. And walnut caterpillar, they're very characteristic in terms of no webbing, but extensive feeding. And it's usually up higher in the tree. And what you'll see with, fall, or with uh, walnut detainer is that the larvae will aggregate on the main trunk or on a large branch and they all molt together. So they'll shed their skins and leave this little remnant behind. And it's not so little. Sometimes it may be the size of a small ball, uh, larger than a softball. So that's pretty characteristic of walnut detainer. And then the, the damage that you see here. They kind of have sort of a magenta color when they're young and they get a little bit older. They have they take on this dark and black color with the white hairs and so forth. And then eventually they pupate, fall, they fall to the ground and pupate. That's walnut detainer. And those are the major pests of concern that we'll talk about this time of the, of the year, as well as the ones that could come on uh, later on. Bill, we had a, a question. Uh, Sharon asked if there are any natural predators for pecan net case bear. Yeah, there are plenty. And, and sometimes it would surprise you what some of those are. We're actually seeing some activity already in some parts of the state with the wheel bug, the large uh, uh, assassin bug, and they will take on pecan nutcase bear. They'll even feed on eggs from time to time, and they'll take on the larvae if they can capture the larvae before they enter the nut. Uh, in addition to that, uh, even lady beetles can feed on, uh, on some of the larval stages and egg stages. Another one that's uh, kind of interesting is that we see this, this ligus bug. It's a, it's actually it looks like a ligus bug. It's a mirid in that same group of organisms. 
it's a little myriad, which is sort of a pest of a lot of crops like cotton and, and other crops like that, that will feed on seeds, it'll feed on um, other materials, but it actually can be an egg predator. So I don't get overly concerned when I see those little uh, plant bugs feeding around the clusters. Uh, whether they feed on the clusters or not remains to be seen. I haven't really seen any extensive damage from them, but I do see them feeding on eggs, case bearer eggs from time to time. Okay, I have another question. Susan asked if, uh, since they had a significant freeze event and everything is still, you know, not coming out just yet, will that delay the case bearer activity? And do they no need to go ahead and do their traps or, or not? I would say uh, you probably still need to run your traps. Yeah, you probably still need to run your traps. Now, the, the chances are you may not need to treat. And sometimes we've seen heavy case bear populations in terms of adult captures in the traps that we don't necessarily end up treating for the larval stage. And the reason is because of those weather events, those severe weather events. So kind of keep that as my, in mind as you make the decision. The other part of the decision is, do you have enough of a crop to protect? So if you don't have enough of a crop to protect, then maybe the question is, do you need to even be concerned about pecan nut case bear? In, in this case, if you've got no crop to protect, no, you probably don't need to be concerned about pecan nut case bear. But there are other organisms out there that perhaps should get your attention down the road. And, and they may not know if they have a crop just yet, if they're just now that's right. you know, pushing out. So this is the time you would normally think of case bear but one of, the, one of the things that we found out about case bearer years ago, uh, Dr. Grantham did the work. Uh, he was one of my graduate students. And what he found out was that uh, mating for the pecan nut case bearer typically took place initially up high in the canopy, almost at the top of the tree. But then egg, egg laying or oviposition was evenly distributed throughout the tree. So you know, and he had two years of results with that, and it was the same each year. So if you're actually checking in the lower portion of the tree, you should be able to make an accurate decision. Even though you may not have a, a, a very good low crop, you may still be able to, if you have that high crop that Becky described earlier, uh, you still may be able to make a pretty accurate decision. So uh, Sharon just commented that she has um white clover, crimson clover, red clover, attracting a lot of lady beetles. So that is one benefit uh, of having clovers in our pecan orchards and, and also, you know, they're fixing nitrogen as well. So yeah, that's, a, that too. that's an excellent thing to bring up because uh, it, but it also, you got to be careful about this because the clovers are nice, especially from maybe attracting several predators, including lace wings and things of that nature and lady beetles. The downside and nitrogen, oh man, it's great as far as nitrogen control. The downside is that it also attracts pollinators. So if you're concerned for pollinators, which pecan is not a, an insect pollinated crop, it's a wind pollinated crop. But if your concern is for pollinators as well, uh, you might need to think rethink that that clover situation. Uh, it does bring in a lot of honeybees and a lot of other bumblebees and a lot of other things that are, are there for the pollen or the nectar, so. So you're meaning that they may get, um, you may damage the pollinators due to your insecticide applications. Yep. Yeah, the nice, thing, the nice thing about most of the materials that we have uh, nowadays, when you get that label, uh, EPA has required any, of those chemistries that have a profound effect on pollinators to have a specific section on its effects on pollinators, if it's one of those that has a, uh, a risk to pollinators. All right, well, thanks, Phil. That was good information and, and um, a good refresher. If we, uh, we, if we have covered pecan nut case bear, it's always good to hear 
uh, it again. Sometimes it takes a while to sink in and, and get all the questions and everything. So that'll be good. Um, so thank and, you. And just, and just so you know, Phil, I talked to uh, Monty Nesbitt this morning and he said they were probably going to spray for Case Bear in the next couple of days. So yeah. I guess you could say it, it's on the way. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. That's South Texas, they're at least seeing, you know, getting ready to spray down there. Yeah, that's not unusual for South Texas. Uh, we usually, we're down around the Red River, we usually treat them by the end of May, you know, by that last week of May, maybe as early as the 23rd, 24th. But in northern Oklahoma, it's that first week of June. Mm -hmm. All right, Charlie, would you like to go ahead and do your presentation on training? We'll, we'll attempt to see, make it work. We'll, we'll see. And, and Charlie is uh, with the Noble Research Institute, and he's their pecan scientist. So um, we will see if we can get his presentation to share. So, Phil, there's a question um, in the chat. that says, I uh, didn't understand the pollinator issue. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good question. OK, clover, the clovers that we mentioned, they provide extra nitrogen to the tree, which is fantastic. But they also attract pollinators. Pecans do not do that. Pecans are not pollinated by bees or wasps or things of that nature. Now they may occur in the trees randomly, but the pollen is not a source of, uh, of protein for the, or carbohydrates for the for the honeybees or for anything else for that matter. So just so you understand, if you're growing uh, clovers underneath your pecan tree and then you spray it with something that you spray your trees with something to kill case bear or to kill pecan weevil or whatever the case may be, it's gonna drift down and you're gonna kill, you're potentially gonna kill pollinators that are in that clover. Okay. So the the clover is good for fixing nitrogen and moving in some of those beneficial, um, beneficial insects that feed on some of the insects that give us trouble. Right. But we have to be careful if they're in the orchard and use those, those maybe use those pesticides <laughs> that are specific to a certain type of insect, like those um, growth regulators that just affect the caterpillar larva right just right yeah so be more careful on what type of insecticides you're using so all yep. right well i'm going to go ahead charlie and i'll i'll talk, go ahead and talk about uh four flap grafting right. and then we can uh, we can put you on the agenda for for june uh, i mean i've tried to, I've, I've tried to share it and i, it I know sometimes it, just, and... it just doesn't happen sometimes so that's that's fine um and we'll we'll get it next time so, so go ahead and uh, stop sharing if it's okay. And I'll see if I can share mine now. All right, so can you see my screen all right? Yeah. I, had, I had debated on whether to show a video or a presentation. And I'm, I'm not, I'm afraid that the video quality won't be quite as good uh, coming through Zoom. So in the follow-up email, I'm going to attach a link for a YouTube video on for flap grafting that we just did. Um, I'm going to apologize for some of the photos in my grafting, or my grafting presentation, and uh, they're very old. I just did new photos this week and the photographer couldn't get them back to me in time to update my presentation, but I will get those updated and attach them to fact sheets and some other things. So we'll have some new and improved uh, pictures for our, our grafting uh, fact sheets and other presentations. But we'll talk about uh, four flap grafting and grafting in general. Why do we need to graft a pecan tree? If you plant a, a a pawnee nut, we're not going to end up with pawnee nuts on that tree that we grow from that nut. It will be a pawnee seedling. And a seedling, we don't really know exactly what it's going to be, uh, what it 
It may be better than the original Pawnee tree that we, uh, the Pawnee nut that we planted, or it may be uh, inferior. So we wanted to know what we're uh, going to be growing because it's a long-term investment. We don't wanna wait many years to figure out if this nut is going to be a better or worse uh, fruit than, than the one that we started with. So pecans don't come true from, from seed. Um, they are cross-pollinated and there's a lot of genetic variation. And so to eliminate this variation of the variability in the quality, we're going to be grafting or doing asexual propagation using those, those cuttings from a known variety and grafting or budding it in, onto a rootstock. And so that's how we, um, how we keep the, the genetics the same from tree to tree is by grafting or budding. And so, um, get my, everything's a little fussy today. Um, so if you take a look at this, this picture, Charles Rolla gave me this picture. It was from a grower in Kansas and he had one tree that he really, really liked the tree and how it produced each season. It didn't have any disease issues. It was early ripening, good quality. So he collected um, a five gallon bucket of nuts from this tree, planted them out in rows, allowed those trees to grow from those seed. And then he collected one nut from each of those trees that he grew. And so he displayed those on the board to show the differences in what the trees, uh, the, the, the nuts look like from those, those trees that were uh, planted from seed. And so you can see some of them look similar, some of them look very different. And then all of those holes that don't have a nut are from trees that hadn't produced any pecans yet. And this was after 15 years. So if we're planting from seed or using uh, ungrafted trees, it's going to take longer to come into production as well. When we graft uh, onto a rootstock, then our production is going to be much quicker as well. But you can see there's a lot of variability. So that's why we use grafting and budding. So the important thing about grafting is having good cambium contact. That's our success, how we, we get it to work. And the cambial uh, layer is, it's just a, between the bark and the wood or right between the xylem and the phloem, it's a single layer of cells. And it, when wounded, this forms the callus tissue and it heals from the graft wood and the rootstock together. So it, it all heals together, forms this wound callus tissue. And so we have to have good contact from the graft wood and the rootstock and have those cambial tissues touching. And the more tissue touching, the better success rate we have. And that's how we get them to, to join together and have one, uh, one tree. But that graft wood and the cambial tissue is subject to drying out. And so we have to be kind of quick in our grafts that we're making. And like I said, increased area of that tissue um, touching means our increased success rate. So our, our graft wood or our sign wood, there's a fact sheet, HLA 6217. It talks about how to collect this graft wood during the dormant season. And it's usually last year's growth. So it's one year old wood with nice primary buds. And, and on the, the second year old and older wood, you don't see those primary buds sticking out like that. So it's a good way to see where we're collecting our, our wood. But you can also order graft wood. And this uh, link right here, it shows you uh, some sources of graft wood uh, people that will sell it to you. But keep it protected in the refrigerator, in the crisper drawer over the winter. And we don't want it to dry out. We don't want it too wet because it can mold. So protect it. And that fact sheet tells you about how to store it properly. So there's several different types of, of graphs or propagation. Uh, Charlie, he's been doing hundreds, if not thousands of whip and tongue graphs, I think lately, splice and tongue. However, there's different names for it, but a bench graph. Uh, HLA 6205 talks about how to do that, uh, that graft. And it's usually the stock and the sign are gonna be both dormant and they're gonna be about the same size. Then the patch bud is uh, fact sheet HLA 6206. 
it's transferring only the bud. And so we can do that in the spring or in late summer. So you have a couple of options for timing of that uh, budding. Uh, and then bark graft and foreflap graft, we do the, these two graphs when the, the growing, the stock, the root stock is slipping, the bark slipping, that just means it'll peel free from the wood, the bark peels off. If it's uh, winter time, that bark is stuck to the wood and it would tear or rip or you couldn't even peel it from, from the wood. So we're using a growing root stock and a dormant piece of cyan or graft wood. So in a bark graft, we're usually put the, putting those on larger uh, diameter uh, trunks or, or scaffold branches. We can top work trees. And the Hoffman showed us how to do a bark graft uh, last month on our Zoom. And then for the four flap graft, the fact sheet is HLA 6230. It's used on smaller trees and we need graft wood that is just slightly larger than our root stock for this graft. And so it's really good in converting those seedling trees or small trees uh, to the, the varieties. So this just has uh, some of the different items that you might need. Uh, you don't need all of them and it depends on how you finish your graft if you need some of these, these things. But I'll talk about um, as we go along what are some of the tools are that we might need. So the four flap graft, the stock is slightly smaller than the, the cyan diameter, and that helps to get good contact. And I'll show you a picture of that in just a little bit. But the four flap graft, because it has four flaps, it gives us much more uh, potential contact from the cambial layers of both the, the graft wood and the root stock. So it's a little bit easier to do. And like I said, dormant graft wood, a growing root stock. And end of June or end of April until early June is the time frame that we're doing our grafting. Now, some of these pictures, I, I tell you, they're they're probably 15 or 20 years old, so I apologize. But we're going to find our our trees that we're going to be grafting. If you're grafting in an area where you have cattle or other animals that might be grazing that area, you want to graft up higher in the tree. So maybe even getting on the back of your tailgate to be able to graft up high. Cattle, horses, they have a tendency to eat that nice lush new gro uh, growth. And so if you can do your graft up higher, they're not going to be eating your grafts off. And if you're um, using a, a cold hardy rootstock, we want to put our four flap graft on at least um, 18 to 24 inches above the ground. And that gives us more of that cold hardy rootstock uh, protection in, in our tree. I had talked to one of our growers in Sepulpa and he said the, uh, the, the trees that he had grafted up higher, he had less cold damage on some of those trees. So it really, it does impact um, the cold hardiness of the trees. In the nursery, a lot of the time they're grafted at the soil line or just slightly above the soil line, so you don't get as much of that benefit. So we're going to find our nice uh, tree that we're going to be grafting and we're going to cut off the top part. Uh, wherever it lines up matches our graft wood uh, size that we have. Now, the first step, and it's usually one that I forget, uh, especially at the first of the season, is applying our rubber band. And that rubber band is just going to be there to give you an extra little helper in, the, in one of the steps of this grafting. And so we lightly wrap that around, slide it down out of the way, and uh, it's going to be used to hold, uh, hold the flaps in place with, so we don't have to have a third hand in one of these steps. Then we're going to make sure that our graft wood is about this just slightly larger than our rootstock. So you can see how this picture is kind of blurry. You can see that it's slightly larger than the rootstock. If it was smaller, when we made our cuts on this piece of graft wood, then we tried to match up our flaps, there would be, it would be dip more difficult to match those flaps to the, the cut places. But we're going to um, look for an area on our rootstock that has some nice uh, smooth bark and uh, not very many buds, uh, bud scars as well. We're going to take our knife 
And this picture shows slicing it downward. I like to put my knife in upside down with my hand below the knife blade and use my thumb to push my blade into that wood. And I use almost the entire two inches of that, that blade on my grafting knife. So I press it in until it hits the wood. And then I do another cut on the opposite side of the rootstock. So I'll end up with uh, four slices, like northeast, south, and west. And, um, and those are going to be my flaps. So make those four cuts about two inches long. Then I'm going to take my graft wood, and I'm going to make four cuts on each of the sides. And make sure that your buds are, are facing upward. We don't want to try to graft upside down. So make sure they're pointing up. And we're going to make our four cuts about two inches long, or slightly maybe two and a half inches long on our graft wood. And so we want to be exposing the cambial tissue along these cuts. And so when we're through, we'll have cambial tissue exposed on four sides of that piece of wood. And it will kind of look like a square when you look at the end. Then we're going to open up our flaps carefully. And we don't really want to touch the inside of those flaps because we have oils on our fingers and it can cause some problems. But we pull those flaps back and you can see it peels nicely because the bark's slipping. This is all, also called a banana graft and you can see why. Um, but we peel those flaps back and then we're going to carefully use our pruners to cut that plug out of that middle part. So don't cut your flaps off because that's what we're going to need um, to slide up over our cuts that we just made. It does happen occasionally. We'll just uh, cut it down below and redo those, those flaps again if you accidentally cut it off. So remove that plug. And then you're going to insert your, insert your piece of graft wood into that area um, where this is removed. So put it upside down. And this, this picture is very poor in showing flap alignment for one thing. But we want to make sure that these flaps are lining up with these cuts. So we want to have that cambial tissue on the flap line up with the edge of these cuts. And we don't want a lot of space. We want to have nice flat cuts on our graft wood at this, this location as well. Now, if this wood was smaller, our flaps would be touching each other. So we want to expand it out just a little bit, have a little bit of, of the, the bark showing between the flaps but line these flaps carefully with, with these cut surfaces. Roll your rubber band up and it will hold it in place. And then you can kind of move those flaps around where they match up better. Now, if you're doing the, the method, the, the old method that we, we used to do all the time that's in our fact sheet and that Dick Hoffman was talking about, then we were gonna, we're gonna use either masking tape or some type of grafting tape to tightly wind around that, that exposed cut surface. We want it tight, but not too tight that we're moving those flaps. Um, this is gonna provide our stability. And if we're doing the, the American method at this stage, we would take our, our duct tape, just regular duct tape, and the cheaper duct tape sometimes works better, and just wrap around that, those flaps from maybe um, half inch below to a half inch above those flaps. And then at that point, we're through with, with our finishing on, on an American method. So duct tape is the only finishing on that. But if we're using the conventional four flap finishing method, we're going to go ahead and piece of, put a piece of aluminum foil around that taped area. It's going to reflect the sun, reduce the heat on that graft union. And then we're going to take just a, a cheap um, sandwich baggie, tear the end, the corner of it out, and then carefully put it over the top of that piece of wood. We don't want to break off the buds that are on here, but just slide it down. And then you can either use masking tape or string or something to tie that baggie in place. And that's going to keep the moisture in and um, 
just make a like a little greenhouse kind of. But um, so this step, the American method, we're going to stop after wrapping it with duct tape. And then the, the regular conventional method, we're going to be applying the foil and the baggie. Now to finish it at that point, um, Jim Smith, he likes to use wood glue or, or Elmer's glue and just put a little dab on top of our cut surface. I like to use orange shellac and I've got a handy little thing with a, a paintbrush that goes into a, a bottle. And so I'll use that amber shellac and I will paint the entire piece of graft wood from the point that it was covered with tape all the way to the top. When those buds start to swell, they'll crack through that shellac and, and the rest of the wood will stay um, protected from drying out. But our buds just push right through and it doesn't impede their, their breaking. And then the final step to finishing is either find a piece of, of stick that you cut off that graft or use a bamboo shoot, uh, bamboo piece of wood and wrap it uh, like a bird perch. We're gonna put a maybe duct tape or some type of tape below our graft union because we're not gonna wiggle that graft there, but uh, attach it below the graft where the birds have something else to perch on rather than our, our piece of graft wood. And I would rather have this perch a little bit closer to our, our graft wood than it is right in this picture. Uh, birds have a lot of um, force when they fly, they kind of kick off. And so if they're landing on our, our piece of graft wood, it's gonna loosen that, uh, that union there, move our flaps, and we're gonna have problem with, with having our, a successful graft union provide them with another perch and they'll sit on that instead of our graft. And then after, this is what it looks like when we're through. And then after a couple weeks to three weeks, it depends on the weather and how active your, your trees are growing, you'll start to get new buds. These new buds will start to break and push. And so you may end up with something that looks like this picture behind us. And you can see you've got multiple buds pushing from from that one area so maybe the primary and secondary bud both pushed so we may have to do some um, some shoot removal so we don't get bad crotch, crotch angles or uh, we may want to pinch out the tops of the, some of these so we'll get all the energy up to our main shoot that's going to be uh, what we're going to turn into our trunk but actually what I'm trying to, to stress is our training begins that, that first season. And Charlie will talk a little bit about uh, training, but maybe we can follow along with some of our, our graphs this season and show how to, um, how to train them through the year as well. But after a successful four flap, you can see the flaps right here. All of this is callus tissue where it's healed together. And so this from this uh, portion up, it's always going to be what variety we grafted to it. And from here below, it's going to be the root stock. If we get buds pushing from these, this flap area, we really don't uh, want to leave those because we don't know if it's root stock or the variety that we've, that we've grafted. And in just a little time, you won't be able to see the flaps anymore. Uh, they'll, they'll start to disappear. Sometimes you may be able to see a bark change, but you won't actually see, see the flaps. And then uh, we want to remove, if we've got a tree that has, uh, maybe we didn't remove all the branches from below the graft. If our, our um, if this growth is coming up over a uh, top, excuse me, I can't talk, on top of our graft, we want to prune that back so it gets the most sun exposure and has the most dominance in that tree. And, um, but we can leave some of these shoots below uh, to feed our our uh, new graft union. So about the end of July, we'll come in and we'll remove that tape and the foil and let it kind of uh, acclimate and harden over for the, the fall and the winter time. And in the case of the American method, we just, um, after a month or so, we can come back and just slice the duct tape. So as it, the tree starts to expand, it will just loosen and, and eventually fall off. But, um, then we'll start taking care of our graft unions and um, doing some of our, of our central leader training. 
and uh, make sure that you know we don't leave rubber bands or tape or anything because that can can add to girdling on our trees especially when they're small and, and really growing uh, quickly but um, it doesn't take long to um, to be able to lose the uh, that area where you can see the the graft union except for maybe a slight bark change so are there any questions on on doing a four flat graft it's really fun to do it's not difficult and even if your graft doesn't take you can uh, it's going to push new shoots and you can try it again later or you might be able to try doing a bud if it looks like your graft didn't take that summer maybe do a bud uh, in in the later part of the summer all right it looks like we've got a few questions here um let me see before this charles uh she has young trees that were planted march 17th do she, does she need to train those now on a new tree that she just planted Charlie, can you unmute? Don't feel too bad. Um, I've already talked to her privately, okay. uh, but I can go ahead and answer it. Uh, her problem with what it was, she didn't have wiggly growth really. It was just that where the graft was made, it was at an angle. Okay. And they plant the rootstock straight, and so the tree was going at an angle. So either you can plant the rootstock slightly over so that your sign is going straight up, or you can select the bud on that side of the angle. And let it grow to continue to straighten the tree up. But usually those trees will straighten it up. I mean, don't don't plant a tree that's really leaning really bad. And, you know, try to plant it so that it's growing relatively straight when you plant the tree. But if you already have them in the ground, you can select an, a new shoot that's on the side to allow the tree to be a little bit straighter, and then cut everything past that shoot off and straighten the tree up that way. Um, but but that's what our issue was was the grass were leaning to one side, and they planted the rootstock straight up, so that made the tree point to one side. And, and if so, it's pointing to the south, sometimes that's not a bad thing. Yes, so, I mean, if, you, if, if, if it's pointing to the prevailing wind, which is the direction it should have been planted, then the wind will help to straighten that tree back up as the wind blows on those leaves and stuff during growth this summer. Yeah. Uh, but if it was leaning the wrong direction, it'll continue to lean even worse as the prevailing winds push it that way. So. Yeah. All right. So, and, and we will have, we'll have Charlie present some of that information uh, in June if possible. And then um, Daniel asked, are there any tips about rootstock and grafting material compatibility? Um, here in Oklahoma, we have uh, a, lot, a lot of hickories that grow wild. We have a lot of uh, native pecan and, um, and hickory and pecan are, are interchangeable. You can graft pecan onto hickory or hickory on, onto pecan. They may have different growth rates so you may have a small, if you're planting on it or grafting on a hickory, you may have a smaller rootstock and then it gets bigger where the pecans grafted. Um, Charlie, you want to address any, any compatibility issues? Uh, generally with all the hickories, you're not going to have any incompatibility other than the pecan grows faster mm -hmm. than what the hickory does. So you'll usually get an overgrowth. So maybe 30 years down the road, you'll have a 24 inch diameter pecan trunk and only an 18 inch diameter hickory trunk. And, and so that can be an issue as the trees get older where the, the pecan is just a lot larger than the hickory and it may ultimately you know, fall over or break over at some point down, you know, several decades from now. But yeah. uh, as far as just straight incompatibility, there's generally not any incompatibility between those. I mean, graft hickory on the pecan or pecan on the hickory, but Pecan is the faster growing of all those. Yeah. It, was there something specific, Daniel, that you were asking about? No, that's that's fine. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, any other questions today about anything we've talked about or or haven't talked about? I'll go ahead and send out an email with uh, the fact sheets that go along with the topics that we discussed today and with links to some videos. So if you want more information, you can take a look at those. And also if you need more information on uh, contacting one of us, uh, you can email Becky, B-E-C-K-Y dot Carol, C-A-R-R-O-L-L -L, 
at okstate.edu and I can get you in touch with Phil or Charlie or any of other speakers that we've had uh, in the past or, um, or find someone else who may uh, be able to deal with your, your question if we can't handle those. So um, if there's no more questions today, I think we're going to um, say have a good week and we will see you on June 4th. And for those that can make it to the OPGA meeting, I'd love to see, see you guys there as well. So June 10th through the 12th in Broken Arrow and registration is online at the Oklahoma Pecan Growers Association webpage. So thank you and uh, we'll see you later. <laughs>